Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome again to CPI Talks. Uh, my name is Ashokan. I'm the Executive Director of uh, CPI, uh, Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at the University of Waterloo. Um, CPI Talks is CPI's uh, public outreach lecture series. And those of you who have been to previous CPI Talks uh, already know this. The intended audience uh, for CPI Talks is the public at large. So we don't assume any prior knowledge or expertise in cybersecurity or privacy. Um, CPI talk lectures are delivered by uh, world leading experts, uh, both from CPI uh, and also from our colleagues from around the world. Uh, and they explain important cybersecurity and privacy issues um, in a way that's accessible to uh, non-experts. So today we have two political scientists from CPI speaking on uh, digital disinformation and democracy. Um, so before I introduce the speakers, um, let's, uh, let me start with our uh, traditional uh, uh, editorial acknowledgement. Um, the University of Waterloo uh, and those of us who live and work uh, in, in the region um, uh, do much of our work uh, in the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is uh, located on the Haldeman Tract uh, the land that was granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of, uh, of Grand River. Um, uh, as you know, our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through uh, all aspects of our campus life. Um, many of you are participating from um, different places and uh, um, I invite you to take a moment to um, reflect on and acknowledge uh, the the peoples who lived in the territories that you live and work in. Um, so let me introduce the speakers uh, uh, for today. Um, uh, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Bezma Momani, who is a professor of political science, uh, and she also serves as the interim vice president for interdisciplinary and sponsored research at the University of Waterloo. Um, she's a well-known thought leader specializing in, uh, in uh, global politics and, and the global economy. Um, and uh, I think many of you don't need an introduction to her. She's uh, frequently sought after as a commentator in, uh, uh, on leading uh, media outlets uh, as well as on social media. Uh, Dr. Momani will be joined by Dr. Shelly Bajaj, who works with Dr. Momani as a postdoctoral researcher specializing in uh, democracy, uh, disinformation, and related topics. Uh, before joining Waterloo, uh, Dr. Bajaj completed her doctorate uh, at the University of Toronto. So with that, um, welcome um, um, Besma and uh, Shelley. Um, the, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. So bear with me on that. Great, how does that look to everybody? Hopefully clear. Great, um, thank you Ashokan and um, thank you all for, for attending the CPI talk. Um, I'm a huge fan of CPI and all the great things they do. So it was a real honor when Ashokan asked if um, there was a presentation that we could provide, and uh, I was even more honored uh, when Shelly agreed to also um, co-host this with me. So this is uh, just a, a really um, great honor. So uh, I wanted to talk today, and, and uh, both Shelly and I um, have some preliminary research uh, that we'd like to talk about, which is uh, looking at disinformation and democracy. Um, we actually have a grant from... Um, Heritage Canada that uh, looks at the um, uh, digital uh, space and, and how to sort of ensure that the digital space is a safe uh, platform for all of us Canadians. And uh, what we wanna do today is just have a preliminary discussion about some of the findings that we've had in terms of where we think there is important avenues for uh, great research, some of the uh, the sort of blind spots, uh, if you will, in the various digital platforms that we think are worthy of greater exploration. And also as political scientists were, of course, both very interested in the political implications of particular disinformation. 
Uh, we know that there is uh, a lot to unpack here and we certainly don't plan on being able to cover everything, but hopefully we can just give you a good sense of what it is that we think um, should be part of um, you know, on your radar and what are the things that you should be looking for. Uh, there are indeed many, many political and democratic implications of disinformation. Um, it is a growing, growing threat. Um, and I think one of the things that we want to do is just provide at least a, a menu of various types of responses and mitigation efforts to try and move forward. I don't think um, there is a perfect solution. Um, clearly governments are grappling with this uh, very, very issue. And again, one of um, the projects that uh, we have a grant for is really about um, how do we contribute to a global, particularly um, a G7 approach to managing disinformation, which is growing exponentially. So uh, I am going to turn the floor to, uh, to my colleague, Shelley, to start us off with some definitions and understanding disinformation. Thanks, Desma. And um, we did try to include on our slides some examples from our digital data collection from our own project to kind of elucidate some of our points with visual examples. So hopefully you all find those helpful. Um, now to start, uh, recent global political events uh, ranging from things like Brexit, uh, the Trump ad administration, various elections in both advanced industrial democracies and developing democracies, um, the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, and of course the ongoing global pandemic have really catapulted uh, the terms mis- and disinformation in our mainstream language when we talk about information quality. Um, think, for example, about the popularization and widespread use of the term fake news. Uh, but mis- and disinformation are phenomena that range beyond the kind of colloquial use of fake news. Um, there's also the growing recognition that mis- and disinformation poses the defining topic of political communication of our time. Uh, governments and citizens alike uh, around the world have indicated as evidenced by comparative research as well as survey data that they perceive mis- and disinformation as a major threat to democracy. Uh, dis disinformation is created, shared, and spread in many different formats as well, including textual formats, audio, video, uh, pictures and images, memes, links to articles, uh, opinion pieces that are framed as kind of hard news. Uh, the spaces in which uh, disinformation is shared is also expansive and traverses mediated spaces, but as well as these new unmediated digital spaces. So what does disinformation really mean? Um, and it seems like it's a straightforward question, but we need to unpack it as a concept. And uh, as we're unpacking, we realize it's not as straightforward as we think. Now, the study of mis- and disinformation involves a cross-section of disciplines, uh, spanning diverse fields like computer sciences, technology studies, media journalism, and communication studies, and the social sciences, including psychology, sociology, and political science. And this is just to name a few. And in general, academic literature have, has identified kind of three components or parts of the information disorder. You have misinformation, which includes content that is false, but is not intended to harm. And then you have disinformation, which includes content that is both false and intended to harm. And you have malinformation that includes content that is truthful, but has the explicit intent to harm. And what really distinguishes these different forms of disordered information is truthfulness of the content and the intent to harm. And moving to our next slide, we kind of want to highlight that these conceptual nuances are useful in theory, but operate kind of differently in practice. Um, and in practice, it's difficult to distinguish at times between digital mis- and disinformation. And there are a few reasons for this. The first is the um, issue of empirical measurement. So empirically measuring the intent of digital content is hard and is hard and tricky. A simple thought exercise kind of gets to this issue. Where do you measure and capture intent? Whose intent matters? Is it the creator's intent? Is it the sender's intent? Is it the 
recipient's intent? Can intent be inferred from the actual content itself? Um, so just kind of working through these kind of questions demonstrates how hard it can be to kind of separate and disentangle these two concepts from one, other, one another. There are also practical and logistical challenges. Um, and here we find that it's becoming increasingly difficult to trace intent to harm. And that's because it's becoming increasingly difficult to trace the origins of digital content and the original source of digital mis- and disinformation. Um, this becomes even more complicated by the fact that digital content travels across platforms. So let's say digital information will move from red, a Reddit thread to Twitter to then Facebook, and then move to these private and direct messaging applications. Uh, in fact, a G7 task force Ta task force report on disinformation identified the, uh, determining the origins of digital content as one of the major challenges in dealing with disinformation. Additionally, tracing the origins of digital content and digital disinformation is a post hoc endeavor. And it occurs after the content has already been created, reproduced, and is circulating in digital spaces. There's also the issue of overlap between mis- and disinformation. Disinformation can spread through individuals who may unintentionally share false information. Similarly, misinformation that is widely circulating can be picked up by an adversarial actor and be redeployed as, a, as part of an information warfare campaign. Um, so disentangling the two from one another is quite messy. And last, we argue that distinguishing between mis- and disinformation may have little bearing on the outcome of interest that we want to explain. And we question if intent matters less than impact. Um, conceptualizing mis- and disinformation as being fundamentally intertwined, uh, self-reinforcing, um, opens up the possibilities of the causal work that mis- and disinformation may be doing. And this may be work that is more non-linear, linear, subtle, and indirect. Uh, the intent of digital content may matter less than the impact of the digital content on our information environment. So given that we need a better understanding of mis- and disinformation in these less visible spaces, uh, we need to have kind of wider concepts, wider definitions to ensure we're not missing uh, any information that's being transferred in these spaces. Now, in our literature, there are typically seven types of uh, disordered information that are identified as part of a typology on mis- and disinformation. Um, these categories are not mutually exclusive, and this typology is theorized as operating on a fluid spectrum. So you will see some overlap between the categories. Uh, the first category is satire or pa and parody. And these are humorous but false stories that are presented as if they're true. Um, they're, they may unintentionally fool readers. So there's no intention to harm, but there is a uh, potential to fool. And this occurs when people don't realize that content is satirical. And this is often kind of considered to be the least problematic of the information disorder. There's also false connection, where when factually accurate content is shared with false contextual information. For example, when a headline or a picture or a caption doesn't really reflect the article's content. So think of um, clickbait articles or things that kind of get you to click based on, a, on an appealing picture. Uh, there's also misleading content, where information is presented in a misleading way. For example, presenting comment or opinion as fact or as hard news. Um, cropping an image uh, would also be kind of an example of misleading content. Uh, there's also false context, which is when genuine content is shared with false contextual information. So accurate content circulates out of its original context. Think for example, when a picture from the past resurfaces and is reapplied to a more current event. And you often see this in many examples of digital mis- and disinformation. 
There's also imposter content when there's material presenting uh, to impersonate genuine sources. For example, using the branding of an established news outlet. Uh, for example, an article may carry the CBC banner, but it was never actually published by the CBC. There's also manipulated content, which is content that includes distortions of genuine information or imagery, and when genuine material is manipulated to deceive. So when two examples two separate images are edited together to create a new image to convey a specific messaging message. So it's kind of like the doctoring of pictures would be an example. And then there's uh, fabricated content, which is completely false content. It's 100% false and it's designed to deceive and to harm. I'd like to now kind of shift our gaze to the spaces for disinformation. And this is kind of where disinformation is being shared, exchanged, reproduced, and engaged with. Research to date has focused on larger big tech social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and so forth. Um, this has left us with kind of a notable gap in our understanding of how mis and disinformation spreads and the potential implications of mis- and disinformation. We've been limited in where we are looking for and where we are examining mis- and disinformation. And what we're missing in our picture is kind of the representation and the space of these chat and direct messaging applications. So these chat and direct messaging applications have really remained kind of overlooked sites of dis and mis- and disinformation and arenas that have been kind of under theorized. And as you can see on our chart, uh, just taking a few examples, um, the, these applications are widely used in terms of uh, user engagement. Uh, you have like WhatsApp in 2021 with 2 billion annual users. We have WeChat with 1.24 billion annual users, but you also have a wide geographic spread uh, in terms of the usage of these applications. And they really are truly global and they're globally used. So that makes the need to kind of open up the black box of these digital spaces even more pressing. And what's important to note is that the kind of growth of digital spaces, these digital spaces as a source for political information and communication has really occurred against the backdrop of uh, the declining trust in conventional media. So the rise of the digital spaces as sources of information has not occurred in a vacuum. It's been influenced by what else has been happening in our information environment. And that is kind of a growing trust deficit uh, with conventional media. And to relate it back to the Canadian context, uh, Canadians are also using these digital spaces for information purposes. Um, one survey, for example, indicates that more than eight in 10 people in Canada use private and direct messaging platforms like uh, Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and so forth. Over half of uh, Canadians receive messages about news or current events at least weekly. And about 46% report receiving private messages that they suspect are false on a monthly basis. So again, the Canadian experience is very much in line with what we are seeing elsewhere. And it's also important to place these digital spaces in context of other digital spaces. So what you see with this graph is that worldwide, um, the way in which individuals see, share, and consume information is shifting. Um, there's a shift away from platforms like Facebook, as a, seeing Facebook as a source of news, and the rise of these private chat and direct messaging applications. And this rise has been quite steady and consistent. And, and in the same Reuters report, around 66% now use one or more social networks or messaging apps for consuming, sharing, or discussing news. 
And again, Facebook is declining and becoming less relevant in recent years, while WhatsApp and Telegram are continuing to attract more usage for the news. And I'll now shift it over to Besma to discuss some of the challenges of studying these spaces. Thank you. Um, and I think one of the things, if I may, just continuing on um, uh, some of Shelley's presentation that I think is really relevant for us to think about is when we talk about this trust deficit, which as Shelley noted is growing, and this is a global challenge that we're having. And a lot of sociologists and political scientists so well have been really trying to understand why is it that we are seeing people increasingly less, less faithful in their, in their leaders, uh, less trust in, in elders increasingly, uh, whether it's parents, experts, scientists. I think many of us were, were very much distraught when you hear things like, you know, Dr. Fauci receiving death threats, for example, for just simply telling us the science of COVID. And there's a lot of explanations for this, but one of the things that seems to be a consistent feature is that increasingly the concept of power and authority is being challenged from the bottom up. And you can say that's a good thing, right? It's good to be suspicious. It's good to question. It's good to always sort of do your own homework. But it increasingly means that uh, the media itself is not seen as a profession. It's seen as a, a, um, a, a basically a voice box for certain perspectives and views. Increasingly, even in universities, I'm sure some of my colleagues on, on the webinar here who are in a classroom, you know, I've been teaching 20 years and I would say that, you know, the students today are much more questioning of even our lectures that we would say are, you know, based on research and evidence and years of experience. And again, there's a healthy sense of criticism to be questioning these things, but it's also part of an endemic feature of society increasingly that we just don't trust uh, information given to us. So the challenge that we have here, uh, broadly speaking, is you know how do you um, ensure that there is indeed a um, ecosystem of, of media presentations and news uh, in a trusted way without necessarily clamping down on free speech because we want to ensure in a, in a liberal democratic society that people do have free speech, that we ensure that people have the opportunity to have satire, for example. I mean, some of the previous um, points that we had about the types of disinformation really are just meant to be, you know, for comedic value. And I'm sure, um, you know, you may have at some point gotten something and uh, it be intended to be satirical or funny, and someone may have assumed that it was actually real. And when we all know it's not, but if you're not really sort of in the in the space of, of the joke, if you will, you will often be confused. And so really trying to find that fine line um, is one, something that we um, have been grappling with as we start to try and examine this. So one of the things that we wanted to do in our particular study was to sort of unbox or unpack uh, the uh, direct messaging because we know this is really sort of the black box. We don't have a clear understanding of what happens sort of behind these direct messaging. So again, where Twitter and Facebook, um, and there's been a, a number of fantastic studies about Facebook and Twitter um, and YouTube, all the disinformation, you know, whether increasingly fake videos that are out there, um, you know, they're, they're quite well established studies on some of the challenges and, and so forth. But what often is the case is the direct messages are now becoming increasingly used as, as we showed earlier. And more importantly, the fact that you get these messages from people that you trust, and this is something that we're finding with our focus groups, because we're really, uh, really digging into sort of what is it about the medium itself of direct messages that makes a difference. And that very sort of, um, you know, personal connection of someone you know that sent you this really elevates the perceived authority of it. People suddenly assume that it must be true because, you know, your, your good friend or someone you know who you trust sent it to you. And that, of course, is not always true because not every user of all these uh, uh, platforms are necessarily, you know, subject matter experts. So trying to do this in a way that allows us to sort of have a good understanding of what's behind the wall, if you will, in terms of these direct messages does open up a lot of questions, even for researchers. So obviously for logistical issues um, and us trying to study this and have a good sense of sort of what are the things being shared, um, I can tell you that um, Shelley and I 
and trying to meet with um, uh, people to talk about what is it the kind of direct messages that they're getting, you know, there's a lot of methodological challenges and, and very clear research ethic challenges. Uh, we don't necessarily want to infringe on the, the freedom and um, the privacy of individuals who obviously share these messages, but how do we make, how do we, how can we make sure that they're not necessarily being weaponized, these messages? Um, and one thing that we're kind of most interested in is what does it mean for diaspora communities? Increasingly, it's become very clear that uh, a lot of foreign governments, and again, we're both political scientists here, so we can't help, of course, this is what we see and what we're most concerned with, is a lot of uh, foreign governments are leaning on the diaspora communities um, to basically get their messaging out. And again, some of this is uh, clearly um, not malicious and it's meant to just inform. It could be um, articles and news, uh, you know, that's developed in the so-called quote unquote home country that makes its way into the West. But we do know that many adversarial actors and adversarial states are also, if you will, using diaspora communities to change their opinions on things. And again, it's not just um, this, you know, this is, um, you know, misinformation for no, you know, no purpose. There is a malicious intent in some cases behind these messages. So logist logistical challenges, of course, is that we can't see them. Uh, unlike again, private, or sorry, public uh, platforms like Twitter or Facebook, we need people's consent. So for example, in our research study, uh, we had interlocutors who we um, are trusted intermediaries between us and others. Um, they were not only, um, uh, if you will, uh, received research ethics training about how to be a quiet observer and to take notes of what are the um, kind of messages that they're seeing, but also very much ensuring the privacy of the people who are sending those messages. And we made sure, for example, in our research, uh, project to not, um, I would say, um, uh, tell us who was the original sender of, of said message. And that's really important for us in terms of research ethics. Again, the methodological challenge here is, as well is, you know, what's the best way to find out what's happening in the background? And, and we, in our particular study, decided to use a very uh, it's a very resource intensive type process because we developed focus groups and met with people and had these intermediaries, as I said, but really it was very simple content analysis to show us uh, basically what they found and what they heard. And then also we wanted to inquire from them very much, why were you, why were you listening and does it matter who sent it to you? And this was something that was really the most revealing was how that personal connection can be very much uh, a really important trust factor. And so think about that, right? You, you in many ways may not trust what you know, CBC gives you and that's what all of our, our data and, um, and surveys are showing us. You know, increasingly people don't trust what mainstream media gives you, but yet you trust someone who has no subject matter expertise, but they are a family member, they're a friend, they're a colleague. They're sending you this material and yet you trust that more. And so it really says a lot about our overall ecosystem that we need to think about. So what are the things that we are noticing that we want to sort of unpack and where are we going with this? Well, again, uh, increasingly uh, all uh, G7 countries are increasingly finding that there is indeed a greater use uh, of these foreign threat vectors, that adversarial states uh, and even non-state actors, um, increasingly, you know, we are hearing of what are so-called, you know, um, uh, you know, loyal soldiers, uh, you know, Russia, for example, has quite a, a number of nationalists who very much want to get the Russian point of view out. And in many ways, trying to link, you know, what may be a troll farm of patriots, you know, quote, unquote, to connect that to being a state backed, um, you know, project is really difficult to do. It's really hard unless you have inside knowledge sometimes, even if you know where their IP address is, it's very easy to deny that. In fact, one of the things that makes, um, you know, foreign disinformation that originates from a state, and that's just good old propaganda, uh, to ensure to say that there is a state, that plausible deniability is so high. And so it's really difficult to pinpoint that said disinformation is actually coming from a state. But we're noticing more and more that there is not a coincidence in the messaging. And, and so often what you'll find, and here's for example, this one image that you see here, 
It's claiming that Russians are moving factory content from an American biological lab. And this is something that was shared during our research project. And this is really something that you will see often um, in Russian news. Um, it is, of course, fake news. Uh, there is an enormous amount of investment of this messaging um, and propaganda. Uh, we find it in Russian media, we're finding it in Chinese state media, suggesting that the purpose of uh, the entire uh, crisis in Ukraine, the, Amer the actual um, Russian invasion of Ukraine is to stamp out, obviously we've heard this term neo-Nazis, but also to prevent somehow the American biological labs in Ukraine from proliferating the, um, uh, number of, of pathogens out there that are going to sort of, uh, you know, create some sort of bio war. And this is obviously uh, not true, uh, but this is a messaging that has been consistently used. I have to say, I've had, you know, as a political scientist, I get family members who, you know, always want to ask me about international affairs and politics and often saying things like, but don't you know about the bio labs? Don't you know about the labs in Ukraine? And, you know, it's clearly we know the content where it originated from. It came from usually Russian sources, but we're, it's being picked up increasingly. Here's one that was translated, you know, in Arabic, for example, and it becomes over time. Again, if, you, if the messaging repeats itself, people start to have faith in the messaging that somehow it's true. We also know that in, you know, in, in psychological uh, terms, we're finding that people often also feel very empowered to know information that they think no one else knows. You know, you constantly hear that, you know, but, you know, did you hear that article? Did you see this video? Did you, you know, people say that as a, as a way of, um, you know, pointing out this sort of um, ability to uncover something that somehow they have inside knowledge information about something that you don't. Uh, you're missing something because you're not doing your research good enough. And of course, the challenge here is that often it comes uh, packaged in what could look like a very, you know, professional type uh, news article. Um, we know that there's a lot of money spent on this uh, by foreign governments, in particular ones, to want to, again, do harm, change the narrative, uh, in, in, in particular in Western countries, and to, again, really reiterate a point of view that either serves to, to sort of confuse us. In fact, much of what we've seen in Russian propaganda, it, it's not even consistent. It's really hard to find a logical thread with the various things that they put out there, but it's almost like they just keep throwing things until something sticks. And so it really, the purpose is to just confuse people. And if you just get enough confusing messages about why, for example, there is a war in Ukraine, you eventually start to just say, oh, you know, it can't, it can't be just that because, you know, we have Western response today to, to support and help Ukraine because of the, the Russian invasion. There just must be more to it. And that really is very, very problematic. We also are pointing out a lot of domestic threat vectors. Uh, you know, there's a lot of obviously understanding of good old fashioned foreign propaganda. That's not new. How they're doing it, of course, is, is new in the sense of disinformation. But, you know, propaganda is, is, is a long time um, uh, thing. But what increasingly we're finding also is a lot of domestic threat vectors. And we're seeing this particularly in a lot of alt-right communities so extreme right-wing communities, uh, particularly in, uh, in the West, um, in some cases, um, they are uh, um, good old anarchists uh, to um, uh, you know, radicalized uh, white nationalist communities, um, you name it. There's a enormous number of new domestic threat vectors that are also now playing this game. And increasingly what we're finding is, again, there is often a similar type of narrative um, that there is um, something you know, untoward. Uh, and obviously one of the, uh, I would say, most popular uh, alt-right type movements, for example, today's QAnon. Um, it is, uh, I mean, if you don't know it, I don't want to give it uh, more oxygen, but it's a pretty kind of scary and very um, confusing type of, of conspiracy theory about the world. Uh, to sum it up for you, it is the theory that a lot of um, Western politicians are actually, you know, um, uh, not really human beings. Uh, they drink the blood of young children. 
um, to stay looking young. Uh, again, it really is very, very bizarre. Um, but to sort of tell you how scary this movement is, just to give you an example, uh, I have a really good friend of mine who studies this movement and by her account, about a quarter of the US Republican members of Congress are avid, avid believers in QAnon theory. So this is not harmless. And increasingly, these are people who are making their way into, into actually elected office. Some parts of the, the so-called Freedom Convoy, the Truckers Convoy in Ottawa, not certainly not all of them, but there were many also similarly type of alt-right movements and using the disinformation space to really uh, amp up a messaging. Um, there has been a lot of um, very strong anti-Trudeau messaging in that. In fact, in our own research, we came a lot across a lot of uh, very strong anti-Trudeau uh, messaging. And again, it is fine to be very critical of our prime minister. That's the great beauty of living in this democracy. But increasingly, you know, saying that he is a fifth, um, that he is an agent of, of, of a foreign government, um, you know, a lot of Islamophobic tropes, uh, you know, a lot of anti-Semitic tropes, and increasingly that has become very problematic and, and, and also, and really, um, it has become very uh, much believed and, and much of the alt-right movement really believes in this concept of the great replacement theory, which also means that real, that we have immigration in this country, it's by design to basically dilute the white population of uh, North America, and that has uh, unfortunately become a very prevalent theory um, that we see among many in the alt-right movement. Uh, people like Trucker Carlson are, are avidly promoting that kind of uh, information or disinformation, and we saw that um, in the uh, in the various terrorist attacks that we've seen just in the United States of folks who proposed this. Uh, and we saw that in that horrible shooting in Buffalo, for example, the person who um, uh, committed that atrocity was a radicalized individual who went out looking for a black community of shoppers because he was an avid follower of this great replacement theory. And that is coming through some of these vectors. And where again, you find that kind of information on um, other platforms that are more public, we're able to stamp those out a lot easier, increasingly in places like Facebook and Twitter, um, they have been uh, taken down. These uh, types of YouTube videos, similar types of uh, disinformation has been taken down. But in the direct messaging space, it really is a difficult uh, place to get at because of course, we don't want to have that sort of uh, full exposure of what people, the messages that people share in their in their private um, discussions, but at the same time, it's a space that we're finding has now been taken over by a lot of disinformation being spread. Okay, so again, what does it mean for us in terms of democracy? And this is where um, we're really quite concerned uh, because the radicalization and political polarization that we're seeing is being amplified through these echo chambers. And of course, we know after years of studies of people's behavior online, we know that there is this confirmation bias implicitly in how it really self-reinforces. Uh, we constantly um, uh, are put down, uh, you know, down these rabbit holes of information. You know, in many ways, the algorithms work as such, but similarly, we're finding that some of these platforms are becoming more and more sophisticated to indeed expose you to more of that. And that is obviously very problematic from, again, having a healthy, um, healthy society. We also know, as I said, this disinformation is uh, very much uh, uh, tends to to be um, against uh, immigrants, it's xenophobic, very much Islamophobic, anti-Semitic. We know that there's a very strong anti-LGBTQ plus tendency in this uh, type of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of messaging. And so the impact on public opinion is something that we're really concerned about, you know, as we saw in the case of the, um, the, 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 the murders in Buffalo, they can have very real impact. It's not just about, you know, people sharing terrible, terrible, awful views. It can have an impact in terms of people's action, especially because again, that format of how they're, they're getting their, their information from so-called trusted individuals, people that they consider friends. Um, and that really makes things quite 
problematic. What does it mean when we start to have uh, an erosion of trust in our liberal democracy? And in many ways, uh, much of what we see um, in these uh, disinformation messaging is this understanding that you know democracy doesn't matter. This notion that you not only does your vote not matter, that there is a bigger grand design out there, bigger than you, um, that you know is shaping the world. Again, that very sort of um, you know large picture of how. Um, how the, the entire world is being planned and executed by a small number of people. I mean, the QAnon uh, has this, just, just that one theory, has this bizarre way of linking all these countries and leaders together in a way that is really just beyond the imagination. And that really just, I think, erodes our trust in democracy, erodes our trust in institutions. And this is where we start to see a self-reinforcing feedback loop where, again, if you don't trust institutions, you don't trust your, your doctors, if you start thinking of you know, the vaccines, as we saw in many cases, a lot of criticism uh, of the vaccines, a lot of uh, va vaccine hesitancy has also been um, exploited um, in uh, disinformation circles where there is a lot of false news about the, dis about the vaccines that was a, a very, very prominent, um, you know, suggesting that somehow these vaccines harm you or that there is, as you, if you recall, you know, these are, they're going to be chips, microchips put in you to control you. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, disinformation and misinformation that is obviously going to harm the health of our society and how to root that out in a way that we still can keep faith in our institutions. Uh, and again, uh, as a liberal democracy, we want people to be able to express themselves, but that age old challenge of when do when does that cross the line? When does, you know, that freedom of speech or that, that, um, that wanting to ensure our civil liberties, and yet you can't necessarily yell fire in the middle of a crowded theater. We, we've long discussed this as a society that that does not, you can't do that. That is just not something you are free to do because you will be inflicting harm on other people. And so really this is something that we have been trying to grapple with um, as a research project, as we start to uncover more and more common threads between all of these various forms of disinformation. So what are some of the solutions and mitigation strategies? And I have to say, we have, um, we're certainly not the um, uh, leaders on, on providing mitigation solutions. And there is a long, long, um, uh, if you will, a corpus of literature and thinking about various ways of coming up with mitigation strategies. And there are different sort of debates on how best to do this. Uh, one thing I think increasingly uh, is become a bit popular is this idea of moving away uh, from um, the tech-based and uh, regulatory uh, legal framework. And by what I mean here is, you know, on the one hand, um, what we've noticed that if you take the very strong tech-based solution of just you know, not allowing people to participate. Um, and think of this of, you know, when we basically uh, had Twitter shut down Donald Trump, right? That was a very tech-based solution of just basically stopping him. You know, his account was gone and, and there, there you go. Um, that's not always the best thing to do. Uh, often that can also um, really just make people go underground. And in fact, um, in some previous uh, work that I remember working on when, um, ISIS was far more prevalent, you know, when Twitter actually took down a great deal of ISIS accounts after a lot of pressure, the challenge here is they just basically migrated to Telegram. And so you can see where sometimes you get the unintended consequence here because it, what happened here is then legal authorities used to at least know what they were saying. They could actually perhaps even monitor and see whether or not they were, you know, cooking up some plans on Twitter. Um, and generating more and more uh, noise. Uh, but once they move to Telegram or to other more private uh, messaging apps and increasingly even using more dark web type platforms, then you start to see that it actually becomes now invisible from authorities, particularly um, if they are violent ones, which is the most important, of course. Also on the regulatory side, um, that's also another way of it. And, and here there have been, I think, increasingly better ways of thinking about this uh, and, and really much of, I would say, um, 
those who are in the liberal democratic space suggest that what we want to do by preserving individual and civil uh, individual rights and civil liberties is to think about just putting the warning labels right so you might see this already if you are on twitter um, and you know a government official uh, sends a message it will say this is you know this person is associated with the government similarly certain news outlets so if rt tweets something it'll say this is russian you know, Russian state news uh, source. That's, I think, a very good way of, again, rele um, um, elevating digital literacy, getting people to better understand and recognize. It's a really healthy way of informing people about the origin of various messages without necessarily completely shutting them down. So that's increasingly being used as a potential a way of thinking about this. Again, there are uh, different um, options also for government. And uh, we have things like Bill C-10 um, that is, uh, you know, one that to think about. We know that, again, for some of the tech solutions that we've seen um, that do work um, are, you know, saying that in, in, in WhatsApp, which is one thing I've been looking at quite heavily, is that this has been forwarded many, many times. And that is just, you know, it just automatically recognizes that the same message has been, you know, um, sent, you know, I think it's 200 times by the time it triggers that. And when it says... Um, when it when it does happen, that just says forwarded many times, and that is really a sign um, for the user to understand that. Wait a minute, be a little more suspicious about this. And in our own focus groups and interviews with individuals who are using um, these platforms, that was really very very successful. In fact, that was a really good, almost uh, like a stop sign for people to take a break, take a look at the messages now that, you know, there's a warning um, out there that this has been forwarded too many times. Now, it could be very well legit, but it just gives uh, the user an opportunity to stop and reflect and maybe start to wonder, hey, maybe this isn't so legitimate if it's being forwarded so many times. Maybe there's a malicious intention behind that. So that's a very soft approach of being able to inform the user without the, again, heavy hand of basically completely stopping them from sharing it. Again, another option is, again, this bottom-up approach. And we are quite, uh, um, if you will, supportive of this uh, model. We feel this is the way to really, uh, you know, make the best impact. It's a very soft approach. And what it is, it's really working with communities and working with grassroots organizations. Increasingly, in terms of all things digital literacy, it's about starting also when people are young, um, you know, to really start to embed, you know, digital hygiene principles to get people used to the idea of recognizing what is fake news. Um, what does it mean? How do you go and ensure that that article you think you read actually did come from, for example, the CBC? There's lots of things that we can do in, again, the digital uh, literacy space. Again, that's obviously very expensive. I mean, we think about it from a policy perspective, you know, it's so much easier to have a, you know, very heavy hand and just say, you know, just shut down accounts that we perceive to be, you know, the bearer of, of all of these um, fake fake news. But it's also, I think, for, for uh, many civil libertarians, important to find ways or at least offer ways that are not so heavy handed, but do work on really strengthening people's digital literacy. And so again, that bottom up approach um, starting, we know that you have to start young with young people um, to train them and to teach them, you know, how to recognize what is uh, what is real, what is not. I know some Nordic countries, um, you know, quite literally work with content all day in their classroom to try and explain to young people how to identify the signs of what is uh, real and what is fake. Um, also, I think we have to keep in mind that, you know, we, we know that there is uh, really a, a, a place for optimism here. Um, we know that having um, the ability to, to, to just converse, to debate, to critique, you know, is really what makes us a healthy liberal democracy. And we want to keep that going. So one of the things that, you know, we're trying to figure out is how can you, you know, create more opportunities for constructive and productive engagement? Um, what can we do about, you know, ensuring that um, certain communities uh, who may be targeted, and, and one of the things that we've um, noticed in our research is that there are sometimes targeted communities. If you think about, you know, there is uh, an active war going on right now, you know, I'm using the example because it's, it's current, you know, the Russian war against Ukraine. Um, and, you know, we're increasingly seeing a great deal of Russian propaganda, fake news come out that is really trying to harm people's faith in um, in, in 
and even just understanding the origin of this. Again, if you take the, the Russian messaging quite literally, um, you know, you would you would see them as saviors. And, and we know that's very much not the case. Uh, they are doing a great deal of harm um, and injustice to, to the Ukrainian people. So I think it's, um, you know, a, a very difficult um, uh, you know, situation um, that policymakers are in. Uh, what we're pointing out is that there is a, a debate to be had about what is the, the ethical responsibility of governments. Uh, when have they, you know, crossed that line? Uh, increasingly, or increasingly recently, the the Biden administration actually wanted to create a center for disinformation, actually in Homeland Security Department, and it was received with a great deal of criticism, and and rightly so, uh, because it was looked at like a you know, a, a mechanism to um, to really start to filter all media sources through government, and, and that's not necessarily a healthy way of you know ensuring the ecosystem is 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 um, um, you know free of disinformation. It really just starts to become another form of censorship. Um, and some governments, you know, I'm familiar with because I study them in the Middle East. You know, they even have laws in place that if you have information that is not from the government's actual, you know, um, sourcing, um, and if, if you are a, um, uh, a social media user with, for example, more than five thousand account, uh, five thousand followers, and this is the case of um, in the case of Egypt, under their cyber laws, you are considered a media person. And if you tweet something that has not been authorized by the Egyptian government, or again, pre-approved by the Egyptian government, and you have more than 5,000 followers, you are considered to be effectively a journalist, and you are now tweeting fake news, and you are subject to terrorism laws because you are defying the state messaging for social harm. So you can see the slippery slope. We don't want to enter in that kind of big brother world, but it has increasingly become an ethical challenge for us to think about how do you manage disinformation and mitigate against all of this disinformation while keeping the very core principles of preserving civil liberties and uh, our liberal democracy. So open up to questions, oh boy. I'm gonna try to put that down here. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, Bess and uh, Shelley. Um, so the audience, uh, you have a Q&A button, um, depending on what Zoom client you're using, it may be in different places. If you're using a desktop client, it's, it's at the bottom. You can use the Q&A button to ask your question and the, um, the speakers would then uh, read your question and answer. Um, so I see that there are, there's like one, uh, uh, not so much a question, but a, a comment and, a, and then there's a question. Uh, are you able to see them? Uh, I am. Yeah. Thank you, Anton, for um, for the, the the very kind words. Um, so yeah. We'll, perhaps I'll, you briefly we'll summarize so that. Uh, um, so um, Anton um, says thank you for the talk, um, and he is a Russian democratic activist supporting Ukraine, following Russian politics quite closely uh, over a decade on a number of channels, and following lots of Telegram chats, and know some chats that are clearly paid by the Kremlin. It's curious to monitor them just to see how propaganda works and how it changes directions. Uh, very much agree with you there. Thank you, Anton. Um, the other uh, comment here is how does, oops, sorry, how does anybody, how does anyone know who to trust these days when we see some evidence of contrary viewpoints? Example, respectable doctors with research challenging CDC claims about COVID-19 and its vaccines. That's a fantastic question. It really is part of the challenge we have today. You know, as there are more and more experts out there um, and, and more access to experts. I mean, I'm sure like many of you uh, with COVID, you were following many different doctors and respected epidemiologists and the rest to try to get as much information as possible. Well, I mean, like all things, you know, good scientists can disagree on things and that's healthy. But what happens when said one doctor or another starts to, you know, uh, spout fake news or really undermine things like the vaccine, which we know is absolutely essential um, to our public health. Um, and what do we do about that? Again, there's no easy um, solution. It has become, again, a very difficult policy challenge for governments to deal with. Uh, the soft approach is, I think, what we've been trying to, to, to argue, Shelley and I, and that we really want uh, more knowledge, more um, information shared, um, try to, again, through bottom-up 
um, you know, community development to really educate the public about these vaccines rather than again, shutting it down. Because sometimes, sadly, if you were to, again, shut down the account of, you know, a doctor who disagrees with vaccines, and there are, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. We, I, I've heard of several who disagree with the very premise of vaccines. Um, what you do is you start to create even more distrust, right? You start to distrust government um, um, and, and policy makers and, and regulators because you assume, well, if they're shutting down this, uh, this viewpoint, even though it may be wrong, um, then, you know, they they're basically have some ulterior motive. So it's a really difficult time, I think, for us to, to think about. Um, so again, no easy answer. Um, Ian asks uh, in the Miss this malinformation Venn diagram, does it matter that the information is false or that the speaker knows it is false? Great question. Shelly, do you wanna take that on? Yeah, sure. Um, so actually, yeah, this is actually one of the very questions that gets to how difficult it is to disentangle mis and disinformation in practice. Uh, so in theory, we separate them into these neat little circles that overlap, but in practice, um, capturing that intent uh, really is difficult. And uh, we're not sure if it matters if the information itself is false or if the intent to share it, uh, share knowingly false information matters more. And that's why we want to shift away from the, the emphasis on intent uh, to an emphasis on impact. So what's the impact of that information? the quality of the information, how does that impact our information environment? Does it pollute our information environment? And um, that question that you asked about the Venn diagram and whether or not information is false or whether the person knows it is false really gets to the kind of limitations we have in how we've conceptualized mis and disinformation. We really, as scholars and researchers, need to move beyond our conceptual nuances to see how mis and disinformation is really operating and working uh, in these digital spaces and on the ground in practice. So great question. Um, Anne has a question of what do you think of Elon Musk taking increased control of Twitter? Um, that's a great question too. And you know, it really reminds me of when um, when you know, in Canada, we had newspapers that were increasingly being controlled by you know one or two companies. In fact, this, in the case that was the Thompson family, that was increasingly taking over control of many different newspapers. There was an uproar about that. That you know, the concentration of um, you know uh, wealth being in charge of various, very few. Um, uh, media sources was seen as problematic and there was intervention to try and stop that. So we understood that when it was in, you know, newspapers or, you know, airwaves, but, you know, the digital realm has become this wild, wild west, and it's become really difficult to figure out when does the concentration of control uh, of these various platforms become problematic. And today it has become problematic when you think about, you know, the, the major companies from the Facebook, um, uh, you know, thinking about Apple and all these other uh, platforms and some people call them the fangs, uh, not, not, uh, not a complimentary uh, way of referring to them, but you know, all these various digital platforms, I think of Google, how much it knows about you. I, I would venture to say Google knows more about you than the Canadian government. That's a very crazy, you know, uh, proposition to say that a digital company knows more about you than the Canadian government. And that's a true story. That's a true factoid. I wish I was joking about that. So what does it mean when we start to see again, this concentration? And we know that increasingly these companies are merging uh, increasingly to the point where there is less and less competition. And there have been many who advocate that they just simply should not be that big, that we cannot afford to have in the global media landscape, to have this concentration um, of, of ownership. Um, that's, the de that's the detriment of all of us. We, we should not allow that to happen and they should be broken up. Um, there is such a thing as too big um, and that just becomes oligopoly, uh, an oligopoly or a monopoly um, and particularly information space. So I think that's something to be said about 
Um, of course, Elon Musk is one that has claimed he wants to, um, you know, be a, open up Twitter as like the wild, wild west and allow everybody to, to say what they want, including um, Donald Trump. I think he's made it very clear he'd allow him to come back. Um, I mean, I guess the thing is there is if you, if you allow that principle, humbly speaking, I think, you know, if you really are a, a, a a free speech advocate and, and say you you would say anything that's great but we also know that for example Elon Musk has been very very quiet about enormous atrocities happening in China against the Uyghur people and has actually had an, a real role um, in continuing to invest in China and actually um, you know silencing criticism about um, uh, this genocide happening against the Uyghurs so what does that happen what does that mean to Uyghur activists who may be on Twitter if he takes over so again you know free speech is great when everybody gets free speech it's not great if it's selective in this case I think I don't know, personally speaking, I worry about Elon Musk taking that kind of power. Not to mention he's got some really kooky views, so <laughs> who knows. Um, Hardeep has a question. Um, do you think that having an ESG score similar to credit score for internet etiquette and ethic benefits our democracy? Wow, that's a cool one. I like that. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, definitely interesting, right? Um, trust factor, right? Like this, you know, uh, yeah, that's really true. I mean, in many ways, people thought that that was what the blue check mark was going to give you on Twitter, you know, a verified source. Um, uh, I don't know if it's quite been used in, in that way. Um, but certainly, there has been um, a lot of suggestions, uh, again, on, on places like um, Twitter that you would not have, and I know Elon Musk was one that supported this, not to have anonymous users, right, to you really make sure that everybody's verified, kind of like Facebook, they, they really make sure that your identity, at least we think, um, is real. Um, the challenge there, of course, is if you're an activist, right, if you are an activist in a country that, you know, does not have free speech and you're using a, an avatar or a, you know, standing behind uh, being an anonymous user, you will not be able to participate. And that could really also limit the free speech of some people by virtue of, of demanding that they expose their identity. So it can be, again, um, a double-edged sword. Uh, comment, I trust CBC News for decades, yet no, I'm more doubtful after some of their false reporting on truckers' protests. I also was a fan of Justin Trudeau when first elected, yet based upon his action in the last two years, um, because of treating COVID-19 non-vaccinated citizens, second-class traders, da, 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 um, calling in UN forces. I did not hear about UN forces. That, I don't think, happened. Uh, but thank you. Uh, Santosh. How to distinguish between early rumors and disinformation, even psychological issues like homophily confirmation bias mitigates the digital hiding, hygiene. Shelley, do you wanna take that one on? Sure, that's a great question, Santosh. Um, there's actually some research that shows kind of the best uh, inoculation against mis- and disinformation really begins uh, in with capacity building. And what do we mean by capacity building? We really mean kind of investing in what Besma identified as that digital literacy, um, how to kind of uh, digest digital content in ways that help us sort it out on an individual level, on a micro level, uh, and kind of sorting out um, things that may be noise, things that may be misinformation, things that may be disinformation. Um, and then on, in a longer term, over a longer perspective, one of the most kind of effective inoculation mitigation strategies is what we call a different type of literacy, which is information literacy. And that just really means making our citizenry more informed about a variety of topics. And uh, where this really comes out is in comparative research in uh, some advanced industrial democracies, you see that kind of what um, distinguishes some of the Nordic countries from countries like the US and the UK is, is information literacy, that the, the citizenry is by and large more engaged, more informed, and that's through conventional uh, mediated spaces. So they read more newspapers, they consume more news through authoritative news sources through the television and so forth. So um, that's kind of one way to tackle that distinguishing between early rumors and disinformation. It's also important to note that sometimes 
adversarial actors, whether those are state actors or non-state actors, uh, have techniques that are referred to as trial ballooning, and they spread kind of little feelers of content on variety on different platforms to see what gains traction. And then depending on what gets picked up, it can convert into a more coordinated disinformation campaign. Pardeep has a question. Do you think algorithm laws implemented by the government on social media will decrease the spread of misinformation? I mean, in theory that, you know, that is, um, something that could work. And certainly YouTube um, has been using that. Um, you know, we saw that, for example, I remember when um, ISIS had these terrible videos that they were producing with very, you know, um, awful content uh, of beheadings and the sort, uh, a lot of violent content. Um, there was uh, basically government intervention to basically stop the continued rabbit hole of people stuck in this because of the alg algorithm to keep you in that that loop um, to stop that cycle, uh, which we knew was actually very much a, a, a one of the precipitors to radicalization of other ISIS followers. So it was really important to have that intervention. But again, it's it's always this challenge from a, again from a political science perspective is is when does it become um, again a uh, um, uh, hampering freedom of speech. It is always the conundrum uh, of living in a liberal democracy of when does it become, uh, you know, a point when the government has to intervene. And I think, you know, we, we have enough, uh, you know, previous knowledge of thinking of the red line being one when it starts to harm the public, when it starts to actually have, you know, kinetic impact on people's health, when it has a kinetic impact on uh, again, in this case, you know, the violence and terrorism of ISIS, you know, it has, something has to happen. Um, and certainly then the broader question as well is, is are, you know, vaccine hesitancy a part of that, right? Um, and I'm going to actually move to um, Sanuba's question because I think um, uh, also gets at that. Sanuba says, um, as a health student, I do see a number of false health information being spread on various platforms, which can definitely pose a threat to a lot of people. I uh, enjoyed your talk as someone who follows world politics and have been victim of Islamophobic comments several times. My question is, you mentioned uh, about starting bottom up, i.e. teaching young. How do we ensure that these young minds are not left confused and in conflict between something taught in school versus something, some false information ideologies they bring from home in their minds? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, if I can pick up on what Shelley was saying, you know, again, the Nordic countries do this really, really well. They they really do start from a very young age to try and talk about what does it mean when you, what does this information look like? But more importantly, how do you verify it? How do you take, you know, in this case, going back to the idea of vaccine hesitancy, how do you do your own research to, to know what's the intent of this? Um, and again, um, that really requires digital literacy to happen very early. And again, it's good to be suspicious of information um, that you presented to you, but it also is imperative on governments to build trust in their institution. And again, in a liberal democracy, we want to, we want to have faith in, um, in our government authorities, particularly public health authorities uh, in this particular case. Um, but that... That, that is something we're going to have to come to terms with that society today is increasingly questioning. And again, questioning is always a healthy thing, but it really has to be not to the point of causing harm to other people, which I think some would argue um, that, you know, excessive vaccine hesitancy, you know, to the point where giving false information about um, vaccines um, is actually a, um, a, a detriment to public health. Um, Scott says, uh, Scott asks, would you be willing to comment on the potential impact of disinformation on scientific or technological progress? I'm thinking about climate change science, electrical vehicle developments and adoption. Um, Shelly, do you have thoughts on that I can add, but would, do you have anything you wanna say about that, Shelly? Uh, not really in my area, <laughs> but um, I mean, I think, uh, there is a difference. We have to acknowledge kind of the diversity of spaces. In our own research, I can just comment that we had a category on environmental mis and disinformation on private and direct messaging applications, and not a whole lot of activity observed on the topic. Uh, that said, 
uh, you may have mis or disinformation being shared on more public platforms on these topics. And I've seen it myself on some of, you know, on Twitter feeds and so forth. Um, so again, I think it's kind of, we have to acknowledge the diversity of spaces and our responses to um, tackling topical specific mis and disinformation is going to vary by not only the topic, but also the space in which you're engaging. That's all I can really say about that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and it's tough. I think that um, it, it is tough. Um, you know, in many ways, um, I think uh, leaning on expert community, you know, universities are important places for, for authority, for um, information. And, and I think because our work is based on research, um, you know, we, we feel that in many ways, you know, when um, the public comes to us for questions. It really is, I think, a public good to to really be able to provide. And so, you know, both Shelley and I are in a space where people think it's not um, it's certainly not a hard science. Not suggesting that, but you know, I I'm Middle Eastern origin. And I think when I travel in the Middle East, you know, taxi drivers, you know. Think that they know more about politics than you do with a PhD, and you know it's it's hard to sort of counter that kind of tendency. Um, but you know we base our 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 studies and our and our thoughts based on a great deal of of um, of research. And certainly we might have an opinion on something, but opinion is different than fact. And I think that's where we need to start teaching. Um, young people, the difference between what's an opinion, what's an ideology, and what's what's real and fact, and you know that is um, that is sometimes in some issues it, it's a controversy in and of itself. Um, you know, we we talk about things like people who um, you know still do not believe in evolution theory, for example, which you know scientists have been saying for years. Um, exist and of course um, you know some communities disagree vehemently with that and, and that is certainly something that we we've seen so it's not a, a new debate but it's something that in the online world that can go viral which is really our key point here the the very immediate quickness of that messaging and how it is being weaponized by certain governments and movements is the problematic part of it and that's where again government who does care about our, our health as a society and our institutions does need to be able to at least uh, diagnose that as an issue and come up with mitigation strategies. I'm going to turn the floor to you, Asha Khan. I don't see any more questions. Um, so, so there is, uh, uh, let me read the one that a uh, couple that I think is maybe interesting. Um, so uh, anonymous uh, attendee asks, uh, how can we as individuals contribute to fighting not only disinformation, but its impacts um, and interacting with people whose opinions have been influenced by disinformation, even if they don't actively spread the disinformation? Can I go for this one, best one? <laughs> okay, so actually this is where we feel that chat and direct messaging applications actually play a really important role um, because they, there are they are unique digital spaces and that we're engaging with people we typically know in real life. Um, of course, we all may be part of larger groups and group chats where we don't know every single user and every single member, uh, but we're also part of family, friend, fellow student, colleague, hobby, interest related groups where we do know those individuals. And that's an important place for engagement in our own focus groups. We uh, learned from many users that they are more likely to respond and engage and counter mis and disinformation uh, in groups, in smaller group chats with people that they know. So how do we leverage that digital space in a productive way where we can kind of start to grapple with some of the mis and disinformation that's circulating? And that like individual micro level response is really important. Uh, we are also have learned from our research that it's important to also leverage um, Canada's resource of third languages. Uh, so much of the mis and disinformation that circulates often circulates in the third language. So um, these spaces are also important because you can counter that disinformation and misinformation circulating in a third language in these smaller groups, in these closed spaces. Um, so I think that's uh, actually kind of highlights the importance of these spaces. Thank you, Shelley. 
Um, so we are close to the end of the time. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to formally close the session here. Uh, those questions that we didn't get to, uh, you're welcome to um, send it to them. So I'll, I'll put the CPI website. If you go there, you can see our contact information. You can see also the biography of uh, both um, Dr. Bajaj and Dr. Mamani. Um, so if you send it to us, we can, we can forward the questions to the speakers and, and get the answers uh, um, back to you. Um, uh, this is the last uh, CPI talk for um, this academic year. Um, as you know, we started in, uh, in October last year, and we have had, I think this is the fifth one. Um, so please tell us about uh, um, your feedback. Uh, did you find these topics useful? What kinds of topics would you like to see in the ne next academic year? And again, you can, um, you can go to um, cpiuwaterloo.ca and, and uh, um, find our contact information. Uh, we will start again with the next uh, sort of season of CPA talks uh, in the fall. Before that, uh, we have an annual event that happens in, in October, uh, in, the, in what's known as Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, we haven't finalized the dates yet. It's likely to be early October. So watch out again for the, um, um, at our website. And when the time comes, we would uh, announce the details. Uh, this talk, like previous talks, will be recorded. And the recording will be available, uh, has been recorded. The recording will be available on, on our YouTube channel. If you registered for the CPI talk uh, this time, then uh, when, uh, when, when the recording is available, we'll send you email. Um, we'll also ask you for your feedback about the talk or about CPI talks at that time. Um, so with that, uh, it uh, only remains me to thank uh, Shelly and Besma for a very informative, if, uh, if sobering talk. Uh, and uh, and also keeping the, the audience engaged right till the end. I think we have had the sustained audience levels uh, right till the end. Thank you very much. And, Thank you, Ashokan. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you.